Hi, I'm Rick Anthony, and welcome to the Someone You Should Know podcast, the podcast that focuses on musicians, authors, and interesting people. We like to say we're making a difference one artist at a time. So sit back, have a cold one, and get ready to meet someone you should know. I'm exceptionally delighted to have today's guest on today. And if you grew up in Chicagoland like I did... This guy was a mainstay at WLS for most of the music radio years, and his voice has been heard coast to coast and around the world. And he's a very talented guy. Jeff Davis. Jeff, welcome aboard. Really glad to have you on the show today, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Jeff, I, I got I, I to share this other Jeff Davis story with you. A dear friend of mine got hired at a station to replace, say, on-air personality that got canned. And he was forced to change his name to Jeff Davis because they had just bought a jingle kit for him. Uh, so... Uh-huh. Hopefully that wasn't you that got let go, but uh, it's just a story I had to share because he he is still known as Jeff Davis, but I always know him as Alan. So, <laughs> yeah, well, no one's supposed to actually use the name Jeff Davis on the radio because I trademarked it years ago. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, and if I find someone out there who is using it, I always send them a nice little note saying they need to insert an initial in the middle of their name uh-huh. or something to dif- differentiate themselves from me because that that uh, Jeff Davis is a trademark. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Well, I, for anyone out there wanting to be a Jeff Davis, it's going to have to be Jeff something <laughs> else Davis then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got yeah, actually- a... I got a dumb question for you. I got in the radio business basically from hearing the jocks on WLS. That's the thing that really got me spurred on it back in the 70s, really fell in love with it. Why did you get into radio? When you're growing up in North Carolina, why did you get into into radio? You know, it was more practical than anything. My mother was, uh, I was actually in college at Virginia Commonwealth University, and uh, money was very tight. My mother had five kids to raise. Four of them were still at home, and I was off at school. And uh, after the first year, I could have gone back. My portfolio was good. I was an art major and uh, ended up, you know, figuring I needed to get a job because my mother needed the help. And I started sending out, I was a member of the college radio station, WJRB at the time. I started sending out tapes and getting rejection after rejection. You know how that goes. But I think I was probably shooting way above my weight at the time. And finally, um, the last tape that I had, the very last tape, I sent it to uh, uh, Gary Mitchell down at WABB in Mobile. He called me up and he said that uh, his overnight guy was quitting because he was going to go out driving a truck. I thought, man, so driving a truck is better than being on the radio? That's pretty weird. (laughs) So uh, he said it's an all-night show, and I decided, well... I've tried everywhere else. I might as well take the job. And it turned out to be a really good choice because WABB was a great radio station. And Gary was terrific to work with. He was very kind and great at at guiding a young talent. I was 19 at the time. Wow, yeah. It's it's amazing. I, I started off with uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television. Uh, I, I was uh, I was uh, 20 years in the Air Force, and uh, I did a good portion of that through, um, you know, doing my, my dumb radio stuff. <laughs> it was, yeah. was, it was kind of nice, and, it, and all along I was working at stations along the way, too, so I just kind of wrapped up 44 years of, uh, of radio uh, as of the 1st of January. So I am doing this podcast as my nicotine patch to keep me from going back on the radio. <laughs> it's funny, though, how time flies. You know, 44 years ago doesn't seem too long ago. I think sometimes we should have, you know, they've got dog years. Maybe we should have radio years. Yeah, that's just you know, it. Yeah, Because it's compressed. <laughs> and how much, Very how, much compressed. how much wear and tear it did to us uh, as, as, as dumb jocks <laughs> and stuff like that. All right, after Mobile, where did you go? Uh, well, I was offered a job. <clears throat> excuse me, I was offered to do a job to do middays at, in uh, in Montgomery, and it wasn't the right choice. It was basically a lateral move, even though it was middays going from uh, doing the all night show. And uh, my friend John Ballantyne, uh, who's still a dear friend, I went to school with him, and he was in the Air Force, and he was stationed down the road in uh, Biloxi, and he called me up one night. He'd been listening, and he said, "Hey." get me a tape. I'm going to be up in Washington, D.C., and I'll, I'll pitch it to the program director. Maybe you can get out of Mobile and come up to be and come up to uh, come up to D.C. So uh, he took the tape and I heard from the general manager of WEAM at the time, Harry Averill, and he, he called me and he said, I, I like uh, I like what I heard. He said, but I want to hear more personality. 
So I think I probably went way too far in the other direction. But one night he called me and uh, he wanted me to meet him for breakfast the next morning. And I said, I can't. uh, I really don't have the money to fly into Washington. Uh He said, no, I'm here. He was actually listening to me, listening to me from a, a hotel near the airport. Oh, wonderful! And uh, I met him for breakfast, and uh, he hired me to do middays in D.C. But uh, <laughs> I packed up everything I had into a U-Haul. You know that story. Oh yeah, too many times. And uh, <laughs> I'm in D.C. and I show up at the radio station, and he said they decided to keep the midday guy. And I thought, oh man, <laughs> I, I went halfway across the country and I'm out of work. Mm-hmm. He said, no, no, we're, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to put you on the overnight show. And I thought that really <laughs> sucked because I really wanted to get off the overnight show so yeah. bad. Yeah. And, um, ultimately I did because, uh, Weem was one of those swinging doors, you know, people were going in and out constantly. Yeah, stepping so I worked station, every yeah. shift on that radio station, yeah. every single shift. And then seven months later, uh, they had a guy come in, I won't mention his name, uh, who really didn't know what he was doing. And he, he was firing a few people and he was he had no tact. And something told me that there was something wrong, that he didn't seem to know some basic radio stuff. And I'd only been in radio for two years at the time. Uh-huh. And uh, I went into the GM uh, because I'd been actually called up there they were gonna they're gonna fire me uh-huh. and uh, uh you know they had already fired other people so i knew it was coming anyway and i already had tapes out and uh i told harry i said harry i think you really need to check this guy's resume and i said i'm i've already got another job i had another job waiting for me uh-huh. uh, i did i've never there's interesting a little bit of trivia i have never been out of work the entire time i've been in radio i've always had a job but i uh I, you know, I told Harry, I said, got to check him out. I said, whatever happens. So I'm at home packing up the rest of my stuff, getting ready to go to WGH. And uh, the uh, Harry calls me and he says, "Uh, I I checked his resume out and you were right. There are things that didn't check out and so on and so forth. I want you back. And I said, best of luck, buddy, but I can't do it. Can't do it. Mm And uh, so I went to WGH, where I was very happy. Great radio station. Lee Fowler was the program director there. He's he's gone now, but he was a terrific guy. He knew what he was doing. And um, a little interesting aside, though, uh, I always operated out of the uh, Military Circle Studios, which were fantastic. They were Mm -hmm. beautiful, like 2001. And, uh, I mean, the best equipment, you know, for the time. And uh, one day they had me operate out of the uh, the other studios were in Hampton Roads. So they hadn't gone over the 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 board with me. uh, And I assumed, you know, what happens when you assume? Mm -hmm. I assumed that everything was the same in that studio as it was in in military circle. And I go to hit a record and nothing happens. And I'm going, all right, what the hell's going on? And, you know, I did it again. And I looked and I saw a a turntable rolling, but there was no record on on the turntable. (laughs) uh, (laughs) There was a record on a turntable, but it wasn't the one that I hit. Oh, no. I think they had three turntables in that studio. So uh, I had something like, oh, 15 seconds worth of dead air. Mm -hmm. Hotline rings and, and it's Lee. And he is pissed off. He says, I want you in my office tomorrow morning. And I thought, okay, well, it's been fun working here while I've been here. And uh, went into his office, and he's sitting there reading over papers, completely ignoring me, you know, doing that stern PD thing. Right, yeah. Looking through papers, and I might as well have been invisible and uh, squirming. He finally puts his papers down, he looks up, and he said, I don't want to ever hear anything like that ever again i tried to explain to him he didn't want to hear it Mm -hmm. and i understand you know it's a professional thing you should should be checked out you know Mm -hmm. i told him that i hadn't been checked out in that studio but um he said you know if you play your cards right one of these days you'll end up at wls he said i think that you're that talented 
And I laughed. I said, well, your lips to God's ear because I don't, I don't think I'm ready. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, the afternoon guy, uh, he, he came to me one day and he said, Hey, there's an opening at WLS as a new PD and you want to, you should, you should apply for it. And I said, I'm not ready. And he said, no, do it, do it. And, uh, Mike Patrick was his name. So I, um, I sent the tape in and I got a call and I thought it was a joke and I'm laughing at, it, at the, the guy on the other end of the line. And he says, "No, no, I, 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 I liked what you what you did, and uh, I want to, I want to, I don't have anything right now, but a couple of months from now, send me another tape." And he said, "Just put just a hair more personality into it, and uh, and and take your time." He said, "There's nothing opening right now, anyway." So that night, I went on the air, and I had had the best show ever. Wonderful. You know, because those are nice. High. Those are nice to have. But but then, though, uh, I got to thinking that it might have been a prank call. So I called WLS back the oh, next day and oh. I said, I used to speak to John Guerin and and uh, <laughs> and John starts laughing. And um, he he said, no, that that was me. I did call you. I said, OK, just making sure he said, by the way, uh, your letter made me laugh so hard and i said what was funny about it you know i was starting to get a little bit irritated mm -hmm. and he said well you told and when you're in your letter to me you said that when you sent a tape to us when you were working at wabb that you were looking for guidance and mike mccormick who was the pd at the time he uh sent your tape back to you bulk erased i said well that's true <laughs> he did and I, all, all I asked was that you not bulk erase my tape and send it back because you know, this time I was actually looking for a job as opposed to right. you know looking for guidance. But he said, we don't do things like that here anymore. And uh, he said, so do what I said, take your time. So I was smart. I didn't send him that tape. I waited a couple of months. And then uh, in April, I sent him the tape that I had done that night and didn't hear anything back. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, good good shot you know at least i tried mm -hmm. and uh he uh and i figured well maybe he didn't get the tape you know how things go right, through your yeah. mind so i called him and and said uh did you get my tape because i've not heard from you it's been a few weeks and he said i'm glad you called because i um i didn't want to call you at the radio station because he was, he was afraid that it would cause trouble you know how exactly, that is yeah. when mm -hmm. you're you never know if they think you're looking for a job, they find a way to get rid of you. But uh, he said, can you fly into Chicago this weekend? I said, if you can pay for the ticket, I don't have the money. You know, mm -hmm. I was making I was making a measly amount of money at the time. Yep. And uh, so they flew me in. I interviewed and and uh, cutting to the chase. The rest is history. You know, I got the job. When what year was this, Jeff? Was this right after that Steve? Was, not was this after Steve King? Uh, no, Steve was still there. Steve was this there? was 1974. 74. Uh, okay. John, John hired me to do weekend swing and a position that they had opened up, which was called uh, special projects, okay. the director of special projects. It was really a way that they could work me into the budget. Okay. And while I was there uh, during in that job, I worked every shift. I mean, I did every shift. And uh, it was fun, you know, because I was working – Full time at the radio station, but uh, in various, you know, various uh, aspects of the station. I was uh, Jim Smith's assistant music mm -hmm. director, and I also was John's assistant. I wasn't an assistant PD. Again, I was director of special projects, right, whatever right. the hell that yeah. means. And uh, they had me uh, doing all kinds of stuff. But I am telling you, it was an education in radio. I, I was, mean, it was. I was going to say. I, I was going to say. You, it you're was. Working, you're working on a flame flamethrower that's heard in 38 states. Uh, yeah. It is just one of those things, and especially a, a lot of the times that I, I heard you on the radio was uh, you were doing evenings and such. And right. that reach, I was talking to Terry Ryder a couple weeks ago. I said, that reach is just incredible. You're talking, I mean, you're actually talking up into the mountains and maybe beyond the mountains. And you've got everything. I mean, there, I've heard stories of WLS being heard over in Europe and such. It is just oh, yeah. a, just an incredible signal they had. Yeah. 
And you're, it's you're, true. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, it's amazing. You get you get uh, you get uh, these cards from Germany and uh, other places uh, in Europe. And uh, they listen to us down in uh, Mexico City and a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, American students would be going down there and WLS could be heard down there. You could hear us on the Santa Ana Freeway in Los Angeles. Uh I mean, it was that loud at night. And uh, when I eventually took the uh, the ship that Steve King was uh, had, um, it was really one of the most interesting and strange things that you could imagine because you're you're on the air and that shift from 10 till 2 is completely covered in darkness year round so you have that audience the whole year right exactly uh whereas uh uh evenings landecker his audience was only uh especially in the summer months was shorter in terms of the amount of reach that he had Mm -hmm. and yvonne's show and certain times of the year when the sun would come up early Parts of her show were not a uh, national reach either, but we had somewhere around eight million listeners in thirty-eight states. They did a super cum. Right, I remember that. And yeah. and it was, I think it was just amazing. And I have to tell you that that experience was uh, not like anything I've ever had before. Yes. I mean, you felt yeah. powerful because you were on the radio, and at your fingertips was a fifty thousand watt non-directional radio station that that was heard pretty much all over the country. And aside from it being, having the little delusions of power, you also felt (laughs) that you had a great responsibility. And uh, I always felt that things that I said, if I was not careful, could trigger people in the wrong direction. So I I always like to think of my show as as Disneyland, you know, right, people right. tune in because of, to be entertained. I've uh, I've worked a lot of evening shifts, a lot of overnight shifts in my career, and uh, there were numerous times where I talked to people off of ledges. And you're, you know, yeah. you're there. I mean, as far as you've got all these lonely people who oh, yeah. are, are busy doing their jobs or whatever it might be, and yeah. you are their friend. And sadly, a lot of people think that you are part of their inner circle or they're a part of your inner circle and such because of the fact that yeah. they listen to you night after night after night. And um, that can be a little bit of a struggle from time to time, can it? It can be. Uh, and plus that people show up at the studio at all hours of the night. They think they're going to get in and see you. And I mean, there, there are times that I would get off the air at 2 a.m. and there'd be girls waiting for me downstairs <laughs> you know, because they were uh, they love my voice. Uh-huh. I always like the. Somehow I, I thought you were taller or maybe uh, your hair was blonde or whatever. You that's, know, they're, they're, that's the one I always uh, get. You sound taller. Yeah, I, I, what do tall people sound like, Jeff? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you, you know, and the other thing too, and I know that you've experienced this because I think everybody who's in radio has experienced this, where you go to a party and they want you to say something in your and in your, your radio voice. voice. Yeah. You know, you got yeah, that kind of thing. But I actually, I've been out here. Uh, I've been to parties here in L.A. and run into people. I don't know, and they recognize my voice. Now, I didn't realize it was that recognizable, yeah. but apparently so with some people. One of the coolest moments I, I had, Jeff, is uh, I, I we had the windows down. It's the summertime, and mm-hmm. I'm in my car, and I pull up to a stoplight or something like that, and I hear myself in the car next door coming out of their speakers, uh, either yeah. the voice tracked or a, a commercial or something like that. I'm going... That's kind of that's kind of nice. That's kind of nice. You know, just one of those. It is. Hey. It's very nice. You know, the thing is, we we are, and and I, I don't mean to under or overplay it or or make it more than it is, but the people who are on the radio, very often, I don't think understand how privileged they are oh, yeah. uh, to have that job to be able to talk to, in in the case of WLS, millions of people at any given time, and these people have invited you basically into their homes uh-huh. into their lives and very often like you say they feel like you're their very very best friend uh-huh. and uh you see that when you show up at appearances the the uh you know um <laughs> the way they the way they treat you is is amazing it's funny Terry Ryder once i was on i, I love to talk to the girls on the phone and uh, Terry came in and Terry's very sly, and I love her to death. I mean, I really do. She's one of my favorite people in radio. And uh, Terry said, uh, you, you're forgetting one thing. It's, it's 
their job to adore you and your job to be adored, something like wow, that. And I that's, thought that's that was really an interesting yeah, take. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, she, I think she thought I was spending, and she was right, spending too much time on the phone with all these oh, girls. <laughs> There you go. Tell you what, before we continue, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Someone You Should Know podcast. We remind you that we are available on the web at someoneyoushouldknowpodcast.com. You can find recent news, our archive of past episodes. And if you're there, do me a favor and just go ahead and just give us a little review. We'd greatly appreciate that. And we're heard, like Jeff was saying, W. Wallace is heard all around the world. Well, let me see. We are heard also on the podcast. We want to say uh, hello to the folks over listening in Ghent, Belgium, and also some place close to home berwin illinois jeff <laughs> berwin <laughs> berwin <laughs> people outside of you know <clears throat> illinois probably won't get that but that, that's a svengoolie thing you know berwin. Yeah. yeah another fantastic chicago personality oh yeah i mean i love him to death absolutely jeff you've, you've you and i've had the opportunity to talk to thousands of celebrities through the years you had music people on wls any particular interview stand out as some of your favorites he's like oh my goodness that was just the best interview Oh, my God. There are just so many people. Uh, I was totally in love uh, with Ann Wilson. I had interviewed, I interviewed her for something like four or five times. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first few times were okay. The second few times, not so okay. Uh, uh, I think Kenny, Kenny Rogers is probably one of my all-time favorites because I didn't, you know, everybody at that time knew about his career with the first edition. And he was trying to make a go of it as a solo artist. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, we didn't, I mean, we definitely talked about his music because it was, after all, music people. But I was really interested in his photography, and we got along so well. Um, Michael Murphy also invited me to his house in Colorado. I never mm-hmm. got the chance to go, but... Uh, you know, he gave me all of his personal information, and a few other people did as well. And uh, they they really were more friends than they were the object of an interview. They became that way. And then there were some stinkers, you oh, know. We um, were sure one, with those, yeah. You know, my very first interview, I mean, I'd interviewed other people when I was at WGH and also when I was at WABB. Uh-huh. Um, but, uh, and also, uh, when I was at Weem, I was the first, uh, jock in the, in the U S to, uh, to, to talk with Rick Springfield, oh, who nice. was brand, good, who, yeah. brand new, he'd just uh, gotten off the plane, literally spirit in the sky, just gotten 72? off the plane. 72, I'm sorry, spirit in the sky, 72. That was the one. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Spirit in the sky. Yeah. Um, actually it was, uh, uh, was it not spirit in the sky? It was, uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was about 72 but, though. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Spirit of the sky. Uh, that's Norman Green. Yeah. 72. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. his first album had dropped and we had a, a boat ride along the Potomac with Rick and some mm-hmm. contest winners. He was very much unknown at that time. Mm-hmm. Speak to the sky. Speak to the sky. I know it was close. Yeah. <laughs> Norman Greenbaum. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Norman Greenbaum. <laughs> sorry, buddy. But, um, <laughs> My first interview at WLS, I was always in the habit prior to that time of having a legal notebook, uh, a legal pad, and writing my questions out and all this other stuff, you know. And uh, I learned a valuable lesson when I interviewed Manfred Mann. And uh, uh, Manfred wanted a a Coke. And so I go roaming the hallways trying to find change for the drink machine. Finally did and got him his, his Coke and brought it back. And he had taken my notepad and crossed through my questions and he started telling me well this question you need to ask this way and it went downhill from oh, excuse no. me it went downhill from there <laughs> and i i decided after that point uh to never bring notes into the studio to have it all up in, up in my head yeah. mm-hmm. and it, the inter- interviews always turned out better that way because i think it to an artist who's coming in, sometimes people don't realize how nervous they are. They want to make an impression just as much as you do. And because they know that thousands, if not millions of people will be listening to these shows. Uh, so I, from that point on, I never brought paper into the studio. I read up on these people and that and that was uh, that was the way I did interviews from that point on. Right, right. I, I had one that uh, you think Gallagher would have been a great interview because the sledge yeah. matic and everything. Uh, I, I had so. I had him on. It was supposed I was supposed to be you know like fifteen minutes with him. We we're going to talk about 
you know, a variety of things. All he wanted to talk about was this concept that he had for a hotel in Las Vegas that catered to people who are having family reunions. That's all he wanted to talk about. He didn't want to talk about the sledge matic I'm going, <clears throat> why am I interviewing this guy? <laughs> he was just totally flat. I just, he was to- just totally out of character. I'm going... That one really surprised me. That one really, really kind of got to me. But then again, I have some really good ones. I got a chance to uh, interview Alan Alda, which uh, yeah. which was kind of uh, very special to me because during the 70s, I was a teenager. And you know how parents and teens have a tendency yeah. to differ. One thing we always had in common, my dad and I watched MASH every single time it came on. And I told Alan that, and he says, that's nice. It's a good bonding experience, and and uh, it's just something you'll always remember. You'll always remember. <clears throat> that's just one of the things that uh, I really and truly love. One interview I wanted to talk to you about has to do with Tommy Shaw. Um, and this goes to, uh, I want to find out the real truth behind hearing Lady uh, buy sticks on a jukebox at a pizza parlor and suggesting that WLS bring it into rotation. Is that a true story, or what is the truth behind that one? It's absolutely true. I was up uh, uh, on the north side at a Pizza Hut, mm-hmm. and I kept hearing this song over and over again on a jukebox. And I thought, that's a nice song. I've never heard that before. So I go over, and I'm looking at the record, and it's spinning around. I'm trying to see the title as mm-hmm. the record's spinning. Because somebody kept putting quarters in, the, in this mm-hmm. machine, kept playing that song over and over and over again. And uh, I was with my first wife at the time, Adana. And uh, she loved the song, too. And we got to talk, and I said, you know, is that a new record or what? And keep in mind, I was new in Chicago at the time. Mm-hmm. That was 1974. Mm-hmm. And I went into uh, I went into Jim. I said, I heard this record at, in, a, in a pizza hut last night called Lady by a group called Sticks. Have you ever heard of them before? He said, yeah, they're a local group. They're over. And that record was from last year. Uh, I think um, one of the local FMs played it and it fizzled out and they were in a, they were at that time, they were in a contract war with Wooden Nickel Nickel Records, Records, which was a division Mm -hmm. of RCA. Mm -hmm. And they were basically contractless and he said they're pretty much over. And I said, they're a local group? And he said, yeah, they're, they're a local group. And I said, you know, you guys always talk about wanting to expose uh, local talent you know, why not Why not play that record? I said, I think it's a great record. He said, well, ABC has a policy that we don't play a song that's not available for the people to buy, and also there are hoops that it has to jump through, such as uh, requests, mm-hmm. and it has... <laughs> show a little bit of my larceny in a second mm. but it has to jump through different hoops in order for abc to uh, approve playing it i said well i just think it's a great record i'd love to play it on my saturday night show and he said well i think your chances of getting uh, airplay on it are not going to happen and i said well ask john ask john mm-hmm. and he said all right i'll ask him and keep in mind i was in the office every day mm-hmm. uh working as as the assistant to jim and um, had my own office the whole bit. And um, so Friday rolls around. I had heard nothing. And I went to Jim and I said, Sticks, can I play it? And he said, um, I'll, I'll go in. I'll talk to John. So he went in there and, and John told me, he said, you can play it twice. He said, don't play it like too tightly. I said, no, I understand. Separation is a good thing. I'll play it in my 10 o'clock hour and I'll play it in the midnight hour because both of those hours were covered in darkness. I was actually being strategic about it because mm-hmm. I really wanted that record to take, take some, take some hold. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, I played it Monday rolls around and they said, did you get any requests? I said, the phones rang off the wall and I got two calls. <laughs> I got one from Lincoln, Nebraska, and then somebody locally saying, Oh, you're playing that record? That's fantastic, you know. It was probably Dennis uh, DeYoung. <laughs> so, 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 what, so what they did was they, uh, they decided to start playing it as a recurrent, mm-hmm. which means that it played, you know, not every hour, every few hours, uh, like, um, you know, like a, a newly categorized oldie kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Right, yeah. And they had a, a sheet 
in the studio where you would have you would the jocks would mark each time the song was requested right, exactly right? Mm -hmm. so uh and each of us had colored pens <laughs> we were id'd by the color of our pens uh -huh. well keep in mind like i said i was jim's assistant and i was in and out of the studio a lot uh -huh. each time i'd go in i'd pick up one of the colored pencils and mark that <laughs> sheet mark that sheet mark that sheet and by the end of the week they had gotten so many requests mm -hmm. that, that they decided to add it uh and uh i i believe i'm not sure but i believe that uh that a and m at that point decided because wls was playing the record that a and m would pick up their contract and then uh and then we started playing subsequent sticks records but that is actually how it happened wow i know i know That's some other story. people Good get story. the credit for it but and honestly, I don't care. I I know I know how it was how it ended up on the radio. Are you getting That's... a royalty check from now and then from Dennis and uh, Tommy? No, and, but and Jay funny y. story. Uh, <laughs> Tommy Tommy lived across the street from me here I, in L.A. Yeah, I heard about that. I heard about that. And yeah. uh, we were neighbors for a long time. And Sticks had an appearance down in uh, Orange County, and they sent a limo to pick me and my wife up. Uh, my second wife at that point in time. Second ex-wife, maybe I should say. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, they sent us uh, sent a limo to take us down, and uh -huh. we were backstage, you know, with the, the whole gang. And JY and I have always been friends. And uh, JY is being interviewed by uh, the local Orange County Register, and the the uh, uh, the interviewer says to uh, to, to JY, he says, uh, "So how did you guys uh, get your first big break?" And uh, JY pointed at me and he said, ask him. <laughs> and so they came over and they interviewed me about the whole thing. Wow. The, I mean, the group knows, the group knows. Uh, I think the only person that doesn't know is Dennis. Because Dennis, <laughs> man, I don't understand sometimes. I mean, I love Dennis, but sometimes I think he's a little yeah, disconnected. It's a little, the head's, I, head's a little bit big, you know. <laughs> well, I ran into him. I ran into him at, uh, you know, when he was still with Sticks. I mm -hmm. ran into him at, backstage at the Sticks show at the Universal Amphitheater. And, you know, there were a lot of celebs back there. And I, I hung out with Tommy a little bit and, mm -hmm. and ran into Dennis. And I said, hey, Dennis, how you doing? He didn't have a clue who I was, yeah. not a clue. And I thought, all right. And I mentioned it to Tommy later, and Tommy said, hey, he's got a lot on his mind. I said, oh, okay. But it was really weird, yeah. very strange, yeah. uh, very, very strange to see him yeah. and not not know who I was. Well, that, that, it, I hate when moments like that happen. But, you know, hey, it, we're bigger. You know, we're bigger than that. You know, oh yeah, no, it, it's absolutely. no, it's no big. I laughed. I thought it was yeah. kind of funny in a way, you know, because seriously, how many of us have run into people and could not get the name? I, you know, I hate could, when people do that. I mean, they'll show up to me and said, "Oh gosh, I remember this." Blah blah. I'm going. I have no recollection. It certainly that, happened yeah. to me with people yeah. I worked with. It's oh, yeah. like, yeah. oh crap. <laughs> uh, you and I have been in the radio forever and ever and ever. What is your worst radio remote? What would you say is the one where you're going? Oh, there's no one showing up here. I don't know why I'm here, or something that totally went wrong, either engineering wise or something like that. Uh, I really don't know. Um, you always have things that you do where where they just don't work right. Uh, if you're doing an appearance, for instance, and many of us did, you know, we have portable music equipment and we do dances and we do weddings and all that stuff. I had more problems with uh unruly people you know and those kind yeah. of things than mm -hmm. i had with remotes there was a time though at wgh like i said they were very rich they were owned by a newspaper and they were very rich they had all the best equipment and they had a portable studio that was all set up mm -hmm. with a marty unit and all that other stuff to, to get the signal back to the station and uh I, i'll never forget that uh uh, I was on the air and there were these girls who broke into the, the studio and literally attacked me while I was trying to do my radio show. And oh, I said, uh. I said, Hey, uh, we're on the air here, you know? Um, and you know, I had to get security to get these, they literally tore my shirt off, you know, and it was <laughs> weird. I felt like, you know, I'm not Elvis or the Beatles for yeah. God's sakes. I'm a lowly DJ trying to play a record. <laughs> but um, I think as far as experiences are concerned, you ask me about interviews. 
but uh, I used to have uh, um, different members of different groups come in and be on the air live with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, Cheap Trick were all my always favorites. Oh, yeah. And uh, Von uh, E. Carlos mm-hmm. came in a few times. In fact, I've got a picture of me and him somewhere. And um, he came in one night to do an interview and... Uh, all of a sudden, I'm hearing a commotion on the other side of the glass. In those days, you know, we pointed to it, the engineer and they would, mm-hmm. they would yeah. take our cues. And I said, what's going on out there? And um, opened the door and, and it was Steven Tyler. Oh, and he, mm-hmm. he was really, really gone. And he's shouting all of these uh, expletives. And, and, and I said... Uh, I said to his manager, I said, you need to get him out of here because we're live on the air and we can't have all that, uh, that stuff on the radio. And, uh, cause he, I think Steven wanted to go out, wanted to party. They had a limo waiting for them downstairs, but boy, that was, that was probably the touchiest <laughs> yeah. time that I ever had wow. being on the air live <laughs> remotes. Now I didn't really have much in the way of problems with, okay. with remotes. Not really. Did you ever have a fire alarm go off while you're on the air? Yeah, I have. Uh, Those are always fun. Or a uh, or a severe weather warning while you're on the air. <laughs> actually, before even before I got into radio, uh, uh, I was at college radio, and I visited this little radio station outside in, in uh, Raleigh and Garner, and it was broadcasting from a trailer. And the DJ there had invited me over because I told him I wanted to be in radio. You know, mm-hmm. I was 19, and he invited me over, and uh, so I went into this this trailer. I thought, wow, this is kind of an interesting setup you have here. Because the studio we had at WJRB was, it was a college station. It was in pretty good shape. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Uh, And I I said, what's going on? And he said, we've got a tornado warning. And he, he, the, the, they had a little room that was, had a uh, large glass window. So you could see through the, the teletype. And it's near ding, 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 ding. All this stuff's going on. And he's saying, um, can you put my next record on, on for me? Because I need to check this and make sure. He was really in a panic. Yeah. And so I queued up some Glenn Campbell record. I have no idea what it was. And um, didn't do it well. <laughs> and uh, started the record. Uh, when the other record had ended, you heard yeah. from the previous <laughs> record. <laughs> And got it started, and he's in there frantically trying to rip the copy off, and then finally he comes in and he reads the tornado warning, and uh, you know it was, <laughs> it was it was insane. It was insane. This is my that was my first that was my first uh, initiation into commercial radio. Wow. Well, because of your time slot of doing seven to seven to two, I'm sorry, it was ten ten till two in many cases, right. and then seven right. to midnight. You've had your share of doing countdown shows in St. Yeah. Louis from 1996 to 2015. I think I did every year in countdown because I was the one that volunteered to do it because I loved countdown yeah. shows. You did it for LS for many, many years and such. It, yeah. it, it's kind of a fun thing because you're part of everybody's party. Do you realize that? Oh, yeah. Especially if we had we had it at a place like old Chicago where we had literally thousands of people there in the audience. That was probably the biggest time. There are other times where we did it in the studio, um, and I came up with this wonky idea to take the time code and uh, splice it to where it would say, uh, at the tone, the time is 1977, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, you could take the syllables and you can make any year you want it. So every year I would do that, and then we would roll it to the into that wonderful montage that Tommy Edwards originally right, put together. Yeah. Got In later years, I added to it. And then I think since then, uh, some uh, other people have actually re-engineered the whole thing. And, and, uh, but Tommy's, uh, Tommy's mind, he was an amazing production director. Uh, he was production director when, uh, when that was initially created. And also, Tommy, as you know, was program director at WLS for a yeah, while. Was for a while, yeah, yeah. I've got his and, book. <laughs> yeah, got Tommy time. may be may be one of the main reasons that I got my job at, at, at WLS because 
he and uh, John had talked amongst themselves about the candidates. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had one guy from St. Louis who uh, was more qualified, I think, from the standpoint of his, his, his resume. And uh, I asked Tommy, I said, well, why did you guys choose me over someone who had more experience? He said that it was your attitude. He said, you just had an, an attitude and we, we knew that you'd work into the job. And, um, and he said, so I told John that if it were me, I'd choose you and, and you ended up getting chosen. Wonderful. You know, so, I mean, I, I have to say this and I really do mean it in all sincerity. And you could probably say the same thing. I think most anyone, unless your father owns a radio station, <laughs> who has gone up through the ranks, owes enormous debts to people along the way who have helped us, who've helped shape our careers. Mm -hmm. I mean, even John Guerin had an incredible impact on my career because early on, um, I was such an admirer of, of Landecker that I imitated Landecker. I did that when I was in you know, in Virginia Beach, Newport News, he even some emulated some of uh, Landecker's bits, mm -hmm. like Americana Panorama. In fact, yeah. I had a, I had a whole bunch of my scripts that John actually used. You know, which was kind of <laughs> cool to me. And uh, so uh, I was a, a big admirer of Landecker, and I'd go on the air and I would do Landecker Part Two, uh, or at least attempt to. Mm -hmm. And one night, Garen called me up and he said, "Hey." John, why are you still on the air? And I said, it's not John, it's Jeff. He said, Jeff, stop that. And I said, stop what? He said, stop imitating Landecker. He said, if I wanted him to do an eight-hour, if I wanted him to do an eight-hour show, I'd have him do an eight-hour show. He said, you have a great voice. Use your own voice. And from that point on, uh, I started doing my own thing and really not getting too heavily into the into the heavy John Landecker, right, you know, exactly. voice because Decker's Boogie voice check is very with Jeff it's, Davis <laughs> it's commanding. His uh, Landecker's voice is very commanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he should have gotten to the line of work that I'm in because he would have been good at it. Mm -hmm. well, um, let's let's but, speak about that line of work. Like uh, Casey Kasem would say, heard coast to coast and around the world on great radio stations. You do <laughs> imaging for many of these stations from around the world. Why not drop a couple of station names that uh, you that you are heard on? Uh, I know you're down in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm on WSB in Atlanta. Have mm -hmm. been there for a long time, and I really love that organization. Uh, they really are terrific and have been terrific to me over the years. I'm on WLS, course, still imaging yeah. mm -hmm. WLS. Mm -hmm. You know, I sometimes to get away from it, a PD will come in and decide that he wants to or she wants to change things. And, um, you know, so I went for a couple of years, I wasn't doing that, but I was still involved with WLS uh, uh, because uh, Jan Jeffries came in and had me do uh, voice tracking on mm -hmm. the FM for a long time, for three, four years, if, if, it's, if not longer. And uh, then they had a new PD come in, and uh, uh, rightfully, he decided he wanted to have a local talent, and mm -hmm. I think that he did the right thing. And then uh, there was some, there were some changes going on at WLS AM, and uh, they brought me back uh, as the station voice for WLS AM. Mm -hmm. But I've been on some big stations, uh, Kono and San Antonio is also another one of my favorite stations, mm -hmm. but I have so many great stations that I'm involved with. And uh, also other companies, uh, uh, you know, that I that I do different things with. Right, and some yeah. of it is production. And, you know, I've done, uh, uh, I think, six movies. Right. I was going to ask yeah. you next about your your acting and uh, and such. Tell, tell, give us kind of a rundown what we could look for. Say, for instance, if we were to go to Netflix or something like that, is there something that we could watch that say, oh, my gosh, that's Jeff Davis? <laughs> <laughs> Well, my my uh, my first and only co-starring role was in a movie called Hell to Pay, and that movie, what they did is they brought all these old timers back, uh, uh, and you know people who used to be in westerns back in the day, mm -hmm. and uh, really terrific talents and people who really most of them had retired, and they brought them out of retirement. Uh, you know, name some of the old stars, and they were they were in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I played a character named Mean Joe. I had a lot of screen time in that movie. Um, I think the the best film that I worked in was called 
gang wars. And I got to be friends with Coolio, who mm -hmm. was in the film, and a few other people, Chino XL, who was the star. Uh, they were trying to work him into a, a film career. And, uh, and I've also had other involvement in many of these projects. I, I do sound design. And so these people would be aware that I do sound design and they come to me and say, we're having trouble getting someone to, to do the editing because the studios, it's very right these days, especially the, the time is, you know, you, you have trouble getting a good engineer, a good sound designer. And so I started doing sound design and I also did sound design on, on movies that I was not in. Um, and, uh, like I did, uh, Fall Guy, the John Stewart story, mm -hmm. which um, that movie was a train wreck. And uh, the director of one of the movies that I was in said, this guy's having a problem. Uh, could you, you know, can you do editing? And I said, I could do anything, you know, anything. So he asked me, uh, he asked me to take a look at the film. And I did, and it was terrible. Uh, and the, it was edited, to, to, edited together very poorly. The opening credits were a disaster. So I said, well, let me play with it a little bit. And if I feel like it's worth my time, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mess around with it. So anyway, I took, I took it, re-edited the entire film, put in music. There were some things in there that if they had released it the way it was, they would have been involved in all kinds of lawsuits. Right. And I not really realize it because they were not experienced <clears throat> filmmakers even though they had a pretty good director of photography. So I put all that together for a percentage of the film. And as I always say, and for anybody out there interested in investing in a movie, unless you want to lose your money, don't, don't, because you will lose your money. It, it is, uh, I think investing, especially in independent films is a worthy thing to do if you want to play. But uh, understand that your likelihood of losing the money that you invested is pretty high. Right. If, Very what, rarely what's, do it. What's the best way to make a million much. dollars? Start off with $10 million, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I didn't lose any money, but I didn't yeah. make any money either. It was really more, it was more fun, and I, and I really did enjoy it. Uh, but, you know, even in Chicago, I was in Risky Business, the Tom Cruise movie, mm -hmm. and I was there. I was in the airport scenes, and uh, that was fun. Uh, Tom, they told everybody to stay away from Tom. I didn't <laughs> stay away from him, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. You know, I didn't ask him stupid questions either. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not that well known at the time. Yeah. I was really busy cracking up the uh, other uh, actors that I was in the scene with. <laughs> but awesome. I was in that that movie. I was in a movie called "Listen to Your Heart." with Tim Matheson and uh, what, oh, Windy City was a movie that I had what they call a reaction uh, extra, something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really well versed in the extra uh, techno uh, term, terminology, but, uh, and we were, we filmed that over at uh, BBM uh, TV. And I mean, they're in this big room, you know, where you've got all the reporters and all that stuff. And I had to take a piece of paper and tear it up and throw it into the air. And that scene did not make it into the film. <laughs> I was really disappointed. <laughs> but it was a good movie, though. Uh, that was a pretty decent well, we'll, movie. What we'll do is in the show notes, we'll put an IMDb uh, of, of your stuff and that people can go ahead and check that things out. Uh, speaking of show notes and such, social media, Jeff, how is the best way to people to find out a little bit more about you and all the things that you've done and how people can stay in touch with you? Well, jeffdavis.com. You okay. know, I've, I've got that website. Uh, and I have a, a daily commentary, which isn't for everyone. It's a, co a conservative commentary that I do. It's on about 50... 55 radio stations now mm -hmm. and uh and that is the thought okay. i do five commentaries a week they're only 60 seconds long uh, i did some research and found that that was probably the most comfortable amount of time that a radio station could afford mm -hmm. in terms of plugging something into an availability and uh the odd thing is i don't make any money off of it i, I offer it to radio stations absolutely free it's uh something that i it's it's a passion of mine, you know, to talk about that stuff. But uh, it's also healthy for me because I can do that once a week and then get it out of my system. And the rest of the time <laughs> I can concentrate on 
other things that are not political. And precisely you know? what my show is all about here, too, as far as it allows me to be in radio, but not be in radio. You know? yeah. <laughs> and I do it. I'm not, I'm not getting paid for this. So it just it's being done out of a passion. Also, get a chance to talk to great people like you, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. I forgot to ask you about your photography. You still uh, you still uh, filming? You still shooting photography? Oh, I still do a yeah. lot of that. I, I, and, you, uh, you and I talked about photography years and years ago. So, yeah, yeah. All right, I, I but, get out as much as I can. Um, but I, I like, I like to, sh- I like to shoot things that are unique, different, you know, uh, I got, there was a whole period of time where I was shooting pictures of trees and mm-hmm. things like that. And, uh, what I love to do is I like to go back in and uh, manipulate them, uh, with Photoshop mm-hmm. and play around with them a little bit. And I'm going to market some of my photography. I do. Well, I'm getting ready. I've just put together a collection of 80 pieces of art that I'm going to copyright. I have an account mm-hmm. with the copyright office, and I'm going to copyright those. I have. Uh, I also have uh, a few screenplays that I want to promote, nice. and I have three books that are all are ready for publishing. Oh, and that that uh, should be happening pretty soon. One is a poetry book. One is uh, a uh, a novel that takes place right after the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the, uh, the the third one, which is called the Clue, is um, it's a takeoff on the secret. It's a, it's total farce, mm-hmm. and it's it's very funny. And uh, but they're all different. The poetry book I write tons of poetry. I probably have five hundred or more poems, and then uh, but there are only uh, probably sixty five poems in this, along with artwork. My, some of my artwork is in there. I've got. Uh, well, Remington Forty Four that 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 could be made into a movie. It's really good. Awesome. Um, that's a full novel. When it these things place... uh, actually get published or whatever, let's have you back on the show and we'll talk about that because I do authors okay. as well too. And... Well, probably I'll self-publish through Amazon and mm-hmm. some other places. I want to do the the audio book for Remington Forty Four. I don't know. I don't know if I'll do audio books for the other two. But I have, in addition to those three books, I've got six books in the works. Wow. And they're all different, uh, very different. (laughs) Um, But Remington 44 is a great story. And uh, the screenplay, uh, which is called Misty Luck, Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, Misty Luck, uh, Headstone, and uh, another one, which is called Zenith, they're also very different. Um, Zenith and uh, Misty Luck are high concept uh, stories. one one is uh misty luck is kind of like a james bond asian james bond kind of a person Mm -hmm. she's young and she's smart and all this stuff and i got permission from uh uh, a uh, uh a local academy which is one of the biggest academies for private detectives in the world to uh agree to uh let me use their name and i also put i sent a note to Remington because I wanted to use Remington 44 as the title and the book and the and the gun in the story is central to the story. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a 44 caliber Remington 44 experimental gun that probably never existed, but it's something that you know it's, that I imagined, and and the whole story revolves around that gun. And I asked Remington if it was okay that I used Remington in the story, and their note back to me was pretty much the same uh, as the detective agency. They said, as long as you don't make us look bad. Okay. As long as, long as, as, long as you make us look good, then that's awesome. that's great. Awesome. And in both cases, they, they, they come out looking really good. And uh, but Remington 44, that is really a good story. I mean, it, it, it covers the gamut. It starts out, you know... Um, before the Civil War, and then the time progresses to our main character being in the war and things that happen. That's not a the length of the story. Most of the story happens after the Civil War is over and he's going home. And uh, that Remington 44, which he confiscated from a Union soldier, becomes a linchpin uh, of anger and hatred. And uh, the guy who originally owned the gun after the war, to save face, decides he's going to go after uh, my main character, Bill Campbell, mm-hmm. and um, and get the gun back and kill him because 
in a fight that he had during the war, he put a scar across his face and he wants revenge. It's a revenge type thing. Awesome. But it really, it's a good story and I'm very proud of it. Awesome, Jeff. Um, I, I didn't know that you were you were a writer and uh, you also did poetry and such. That's really, really cool, man. I write all the time. I do <laughs> all the time. I mean, it, when I don't have my nose in a book, I'm writing once, awesome. you know. All right, buddy. Any <laughs> any final thoughts you'd like to impart with us before we close up shop for today? Well, I, I, I really think that right now, uh, and I, I think you would agree that radio is sort of under assault, you know, especially the AM band. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot there's a lot of talk about cars that are not including AM in their yeah. in their, you know, in their cars or car manufacturers, which is a big mistake. Uh, many of those AM stations are the main station if there's an emergency, mm-hmm. you know, that people can tune into. And um, I think that's a problem. Uh, the health of radio really does not necessarily depend on an audience in terms of uh, the way it stands now because there is an audience there. Radio is still strong. Um, where, you're, where you run into weaknesses is you have, uh, I think, way too much saturation. I had petitioned the uh, FCC to encourage if not require uh what what's called spot casting they do that for television where you would have all of your local stations would appear on the local satellite feed uh sirius xm for instance which Mm -hmm. is basically the only game in town there would be uh i mean already uh, here in la you can you can listen to kiss fm on uh, sirius xm but other radio stations around the country that's just not the case Mm -hmm. And I think that leveling the playing field is a good idea. I also think that some radio stations are much better, AM stations I'm talking about now, are much better at uh, promoting their internet presence than others. Some stations even, you know, that I've worked with have fantastic TV feeds that they do with their personalities in addition to the audio feed of of the station. And I think that... uh, we need to understand that this is not 1995, this is 2023, and our access to technology is so much greater than it ever was. And using that technology will be the one thing that I think keeps um, you know, over-the-air broadcasting healthy, and we have to do that. And I really, truly wish the FCC would give consideration to the spot casting, because it it really would help a lot. All right. Very good. We've been speaking with Jeff Davis, the voice you've heard for years and years, from no matter where you are in the country, especially if you listen to WLS during the uh, the, the 70s and 80s. Great guy. Love his voice. Real cool Thank guy. You. Thanks so much, Jeff. Really do appreciate you taking the time to be on the Someone You Should Know podcast, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. It's great. Take care and stay in touch, buddy. Hi, this is Rick Anthony thanking you again for listening to this episode of Someone You Should Know. Now, if you're an aspiring musician or an established musician that's looking for a little exposure, I invite you to drop us a line at someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. That's someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. Also, I invite you to tell a friend about the Someone You Should Know podcast. I thank you for tuning in this time and I invite you to check us out next time on the Someone You Should Know podcast, because you never know who's going to show up. Until next time, remember, God loves you and so do I.